Hey everybody, it's Phil and Tony here from Rebel Financial. Uh, welcome to another week uh, of the coronavirus. I keep wondering as we do this what our hair is going to look like. It's yeah, it gets longer and longer. I'm debating whether to let the wife try to cut it or not. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure who in the family is going to cut it. Both of us wear our hair pretty short. You're even much shorter than I am, so this is going to get... Uh, well, it's easy for Jonathan because he can just... Shoot. Right, shoot. shoot the whole thing. It's hard to mess up unless he cuts his head or shaves his eyebrow off. <laughs> the baldness is looking pretty good right now. So. All right, so this is a great time. Uh, what we're going to do is go over a book, actually. This is from a, a course, uh, Crashes and Crisis. Well, let's share the screen. Um, uh, lessons from a History of Financial Disaster. So we're going to go over, you know, the general, um, a number of... Um, Examples. Yeah, I wanted to say posi... Ponzi uh, schemes, but they we are going to go over the Ponzi different. scheme. So, but really, a number of these different bubbles that we've seen in the past, and kind of the emotion, the psychology, all those things that are behind them as well, and what can cause. So, as Tony mentioned, um, these great courses are awesome. Um, so, as you can see here, there's tons of them um, that you can learn all kinds of different things while you're driving around or exercising. Mix it up with some of the fiction that you're reading. Um, and they're great. I will, you know, kind of give you a tip or trick from me. I have been accumulating these personally uh, for a few years since I've been on Audible. And every once in a while, they go on super sale, right? So get the ones that are kind of really interested to you, um, that you want to do, you know, that you're willing to kind of pay a premium price for, and then put the other ones in your wish list. And then if you ever get an email from Audible saying, hey, these great courses are on sale or these books are on sale, go in there and buy a bunch of them. And then you can read them over the next few years or even have them for like your kids or whatever the case uh, to be able to learn things. But they're great because, I mean, a lot of these are done uh, by awesome faculty, like some of the best around the country. Uh, this one that we're going over um, is by Connell uh Owen Camp, I hope I said that right, uh, from Duke University, went to Harvard, uh, probably one of the preeminent uh, scholars on uh, a lot of economic theory, especially um, downturns and, and crises like we're, we're talking about here. And he actually narrates the whole thing in lecture type style. Um, and, and some people say, well, an academic lecturing on something that sounds like too much like going to school. But no, I mean, a lot of these are really entertaining. Um, in terms of like getting the historical facts in a very awesome, you know, kind of story type uh, format, right? Um, so yeah, great courses are awesome. We're going to go over seven of the um, of the things, but you can see here <laughs> if you look at all the lectures here. I mean, there are twenty four different examples uh, that he gives throughout history. So it is pretty immense uh, the history that we have of this, um, and that's good to keep in mind because I think a lot of times when something bad happens, people are like, oh my God, it's different this time. Nothing like this has ever happened before. And you're right. It's unique. It's probably nothing that specific has probably happened before, but there is probably <laughs> some parallel to something that's happened in, in history. Right? Yeah, right. Well, people are always involved, right? So we mm -hmm. have that and increasingly technology, which as we talked about, you know, that kind of just increases the the potential for these things as well. So, yeah, so you know, just to kind of give you, we'll give you our bluff, the bottom line up front um, that I kind of take away from this. Uh, and I think he does a good job, you know, kind of going over in different scenarios. Uh, is first of all, you know, these types of events, crises and crashes, um, you know, where people are getting overly emotional um, to either extreme, you know, will always be a part of financial markets. Um, it's not going away. We're not getting too educated and smart for them to happen. Uh, computers and technology aren't going to save us. Um, there's even a lot of theories out there that it's going to make it worse because of the speed of how things can happen um, and the access that everybody has to make their human emotion decisions happen faster. Um, and so uh, from that respect, you know, don't be surprised when this happens again, like right now in the pandemic that we're in. Right. You know? I mean, over these last few months, both of those emotions of the market is doing great, nothing's ever going to change, it's going to keep going up. That's how people felt in, in December, even going into February. And now people have the opposite emotion just a couple months later that, you know, the, the sky is falling and we've got to do something. 
Um, and it, it really, the emotional part of this is people, and it makes sense, right? I mean, you're dealing with a lot of money with some people, their, their life savings, their retirement money, uh, but also the feeling of missing out is a big part of what people do. Often what causes a lot of these people uh, that human nature of wanting to be part of it. So uh, it, it's, it's a good time to talk about this. So again, just to kind of summarize them for you, number one, these things are always going to happen as long as we have financial markets. Number two, um, all of these scenarios that we'll go through and all of them in there have one thing in common, and that's human decisions. Um, a lot of the things that helped us survive evolutionarily um, don't necessarily translate into good financial decisions. Um, now again, you could say, well, computers could run everything and everything could just be configured. But computers are never going to enjoy, <laughs> well, not for a long time, life and what we get from you know doing well financially and economically. Um, so there is that there. Uh, number two, uh, a lot of these things, as Tony was alluding to, um, are caused by the main culprit ends up being greed and bad incentives. You know, it's kind of uh, Steve Jobs said, be careful how you incentivize employees because they'll do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then humans are fraught with biases and heuristics, again, that a lot of times are there for a reason evolutionarily, but doesn't necessarily uh, equate to success um, in a modern world. And lastly, technology can make things worse. So I'd say that's kind of our you know, key, key big takeaways. But now we're just going to kind of dig into some notable historical events. Again, we're picking seven of them. So the first one, you know, one of the older ones, uh, it's not that old, I guess, uh, but one of the ones that's very, very famous, Ponzi schemes, right? So Charles Ponzi. Yep. So, so um, and that's why I was trying to avoid the word Ponzi scheme because we do use that so much. But um, basically, you know, what he was doing was he had nothing, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it's the typical it's somewhat along the lines of what Bernie Madoff was able to do. I mean, to come up with a, something to sell the people. And then because he had more money coming in, he was able to give a particular interest rate to, you know, the people that wanted to cash out. And so as the interest rates look good and good, I mean, I can't remember the numbers over the course of a month. It would be like doubling at times, a really high percent. Yeah, he promised a 50% return in 90 days. Yeah. So, so And he was delivering for almost the, the, the first uh, year. And then, yeah. So people then, you know, and people, again, they don't want to miss out, right? There's no, how, how is he doing this? You know, I mean, where is he getting this from? But people don't ask those questions. They just give the money. And really, in, in this case... Um, the idea behind it was legit. Okay, so uh, back after uh, World War One, they were getting a lot more global. And if you want to share the screen, Alex, uh, we got a picture of him down there, just so people could see. Uh, people were really getting more communication in between, and they wanted to make it easy for people to be able to send mail, uh, etc. Um, and so they made these coupons uh, for postage that you could buy, um, that you could ship, whatever. And, but after the war, a lot of the currencies really kind of went under control. But so say like in Spain and Italy, you could buy them uh, with that depreciated currency for way cheap. And then you could, for like say 19 cents, you could bring them over to the United States. And if you could sell them somehow, you could get a dollar for it, right? And so that arbitrage um, was legit, okay? And that's what he said he was doing. Um, so one, th th there's three ingredients <clears throat> to all Ponzi type schemes. And number one is generally you have a charisma, charismatic leader or a spokesperson or multiple of them. Number two, um, the information is publicly available. The idea generally is kind of legit, like when you explain it. And so then when everybody puts it out there and it's hard to knock and everybody else is doing it, and like Tony said, you feel like you're missing out, then, you know, people go, 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 go. And then the last thing, what ultimately makes it collapse um, is they promise too much to too many people to where, to varying degrees, they have to use future investors' money to pay back the old investors. And eventually, as you see, that kind of pyramid is unsustainable and it collapses yeah. at a it, certain point. It, it comes back to, in this case, Charles Ponzi, too. I mean, people want to believe something is real. And so, the, you know, he was out in front. He wasn't hiding. He was just, you know, he was telling people, don't worry, you're going to make your money. He didn't. He, and in fact, I think in the end, he really believed what he was doing was okay. Uh, but, you know, that's a big part of this. People put too much faith 
in individuals and know that you're not going to get these crazy returns. They're just not out there. That, that money is just not to be made. And yet people get caught up in it time and time again. I mean, that's why we have this class. Well, make it. There's, there's countless, countless examples throughout history of people like this um, committing some kind of fraud um, to uh, dupe other people. Um, and this is one of the more famous examples um, because it was in the newspapers and there were a lot of uh, affluent, smart people that got caught up in it. So let's go down to our next <coughs> one, uh, the tulip bubble, which is, is an old one. Um, and it is a very common example. So we wanted to do it because people have heard of it. They may not know exactly what it is, but we'll kind of give you a, a uh, intro. So this is mid 16th century or 1500s, right? So um, in this, this is a, an example of one of the first, at least where we have good historical data, who knows what might have happened in, you know, zero BC, AD. There were probably financial crises and stuff back then, uh, but we don't have as good a documentation of everything. But the tulip bubble uh, started in the uh, 1500s in uh, um, where a lot of the European affluent really started liking these specialty tulip bulbs uh, that were very hard to recreate. So you couldn't just commoditize them. And so the price of them started bidding up, right? Um, and when they did, um, at first it was kind of a supply and demand thing, but afterwards, uh, once that trend was started, and this is right after I think the Dutch start, stock market had like started and what so, so like people had gotten the ideas that we could buy and sell, and um, a lot of even these tulip bulbs, they weren't traded, like people were handing them off. They were like buying contracts for the future and then buying these contracts a lot of times in bars and taverns uh, and what so, and there weren't necessarily uh, strict rules about it or anything. Um, and so uh, during the height of the craze, I mean, it was multiple times uh, people's yearly earnings, like one bulb could be going for, uh, or what so. And so at the end, you know, generally when things got to a certain point to where it seemed like, oh my God, you could lose serious money if you're left holding the bag at the end, um, it really kind of calmed down. So it's, it's interesting going back that far, though, the human nature, just how similar it was. I mean, here, you know, people really believe value of these particular bulbs all of a sudden, you know, and it was a pretty short lived thing. And it, that's a picture of it, right? Because the, the ones yeah, that had broken bulbs, value they were, were called broken bulbs. Right. Mm -hmm. And they weren't just, you know, you couldn't, your purple ones were only worth so much. But if you had the broken one, you were in a great spot. Um, and, and it was just interesting because they, they met often nightly at taverns and stuff. They yeah. better would share and exchange the contracts and trade them and stuff. So. Um, and I'm reminded too, there is a, a romantic movie uh, with the background during this time about the tulip bulb crisis. And I'll have to look at the name because I'm forgetting. And it was a decent movie, but it gave a good um, historical perspective on the tulip bulb crisis. But it is interesting. I mean, there's been tons of bubbles throughout history. I mean, I think a lot of people remember and think about the, the um, dot-com tech bubble. And they think that that was something absolutely unique and it's never happened before, uh, et cetera. But there, there are always kind of bubbles happening to varying degrees and at a certain point, uh, once the mass people that are trading them realize it, you don't want to be the last fool. You know, so some people will call this the greater fool theory. So you may be a fool to buy it, but as long as you're not the greatest fool, <laughs> you'd be a fool not to get into it, right? Yeah. Um, and so in that respect, um, Let's drive on. So the next one we're going to talk about, to me, is a super interesting um, story um, of a really long happening, the South Sea Company um, in England. Um, and they called it the South Sea Bubble. So still kind of another bubble, but this is very different. Um, and this happened uh, in the 1720s um, in England. And basically what the situation was back then is there were tons of teeny debt that had loaned to the government uh, as they were expanding for trade and fighting wars. Um, and it was very expensive, but the government couldn't really negotiate uh, with all these individual creditors to consolidate debt, um, to make it efficient, etc. And the balloon was continuing to swell uh, from or 
the, the, the balloon of debt was continuing to swell from ongoing wars. Uh, so what ended up happening is there's a South Seas company that had gotten kind of commercial rights to do all the trading in Latin America and stuff for the UK, but it wasn't that valuable because of the war. So eventually they helped to put it into this war, and now these rights became very valuable. And what they ended up doing is trying to buy up a lot of the government debt by selling shares of the company to people, um, which was very good for the government because they get to refinance their debt, and so then it let them even give more privileges to the company, and so it became complicated. And so this is a very interesting story compared to a lot of things that are going on now. When people are like, well, I don't want to just invest in stocks or bonds. Like this derivative or this index annuity or this complicated thing seems like it has some better edge, you know. And that's kind of what they were doing back then. Is instead of you know, hey, let's just own some ships and run a business, and you can be you know kind of a passive owner in this. Hey, let's lend to the government, pay dividends out on the interest from that. Plus, we're going to make extra money from all this trading stuff that we're doing. And then it becomes very obscure about, like, well, how lucrative is this stuff? Well, maybe it can pay us 25% dividends or something like that. And that's, like, unheard of, right? So, like, let's all get into this. And then they try to do things to even, like, like let people buy in on subscription to be able to borrow the money and pay it back later, which just made the price of the stock go way high. And then, you know, a guy, John Blunt was one of the big guys that really did all these things to really just get the price to go out of the roof. And they financed way too much gut debt for the government. And eventually, the whole thing fell apart. They, they These people made so much money, they wanted to take loans against it to be able to use it because they were wealthy now. Sound familiar? Kind of like, today, you know, dot com type thing. Uh, but then, Obviously, the profits and the, the lower interest that the government had refinanced to wasn't enough to pay for that. Um, and so eventually, uh, again, promised too much to too many people. It fell apart. And in that, the, the, um, the English government actually bailed a lot of those people out after yeah. that happened. You know, well, and that's a huge bailout back then, probably bigger than what we're talking about here with our pandemic, you know, in today's dollars. Yeah, and, and you know, that goes to show it too because there were big, important people involved in that and they were able to get that push for the, um, you know, they were able to get the, the government to step up and do that. In many cases, the government might not do that mm -hmm. for people, so. And I mean, it's it's amazing. I mean, so we're talking about 1720s. That company didn't get wound down. It, it was a zombie company because it had so much debt and so much obligations, and it was so big and intractably intertwined with everything, it didn't get wound down until 1854, and it still held a large portion of the um, of the English debt. So, um, like, again, there's been huge things happen in history, and people don't even totally realize um, that these things have happened. We have experienced. Um, things aren't intractable. It's not going to be the end of the world. Was it stupid to do that? Probably. Who knows? Who knows what the alternative outcome would have been if that high interest debt wouldn't have been there and England would have, you know, gotten crushed under their interestingness to a certain degree or who knows? Who knows what that alternative history would have been? Um, it may not have necessarily been a bad thing for the outcome uh, of the country uh, where, it, where it eventually got to. So, again, we're not going to speculate on that, uh, but we are going to move on to... The crash of 1929. So obviously this is happening right at the beginning of the Great Depression. Um, and this really, you know, more and more as we go through these, more financial instruments are being introduced and ways to trade and do things like that. Um, one of the biggest things to um, the, the crash of 29 is the run-up to 29. So a lot of people think that, you know, it came from here and went down. But the reality was it went up. A good amount. It was a pretty big run because you had a lot more people becoming interested in the stock market. Um, a lot of people were making money doing nothing, that greater fool theory, and so a lot more people just started coming to the table. You yeah, know, so they, check out this chart. Put it up there, Alex. You can kind of see, you know, at the beginning of the 1920s, you know, the Dow was, you know, somewhere between 100, 50 to 100 right there, and look how much it ran up you know, by the end of 1929 right there. And so really, like, how could it run up so much? I mean, again, this is not unprecedented. High corporate profits. There were lots of cool, you know, new companies, like new retail companies that were kind of pushing out the old merchandiser that were better profiters, like Piggly Wigglies and, you know, different things like that that maybe, unless you're older, you haven't even heard of. But 
I mean, like there was a lot of financial innovation going on. There was really low interest rates, sometimes even deflation, because we were trying to help some of the European governments after World War One. And so that made a lot of demand for stocks because if interest rates suck, you don't want to put your money in cash or in bonds that hardly pay anything. Um, and um, and the government was trying to keep it low. And there were some, we're not going to get into it, but there are some complications with like trying to peg currencies to the gold standard and what so uh, that caused a lot of that. And with the deflation and what so, um, even real estate uh, was having a rough time from a demand side. Because if you have deflation, then you take out loans that you have to pay back with money that's worth less, but the loan's high. Uh, it very much disincentivizes people to want to buy uh, things. So there was just all this demand for equities because it was doing so good. And these other things, they're just not good alternatives to invest in. And about this time, a lot of regular people, not re I mean, it was still less than 2% of, of Americans that got into the markets, but upwards of over a percent was a huge increase in new investors and they developed margin. Margin is trading on borrowed money um, and they just let people leverage way too far to like, ooh, I made 100% the last few years. I should double or triple down on that to just borrow everything I can against that to let it ride. Not even just let it ride, let it ride times <laughs> Well, look, look at three, go back right? to the chart and then look how much that just shot up there. From, yeah. I mean, that's what people were doing, going back to barely even holding anything and yet making a big return in a short amount of time. Yeah. And to not be involved in that, again, you felt left out. You're like, how do I get to be part of this? Yeah. So if you were in at around 100, somewhere in these first four years or so, um, and then it went all the way up to 380, so you, you almost quadrupled your money. Over that time period. Yeah, but from, from 200 we're down there to 380, I mean, that is just like overnight, it looks like. Not, not yeah. quite as harsh as the fall. But uh, yeah, you can kind of see here. There's the panic right there in 1929. And actually, JP Morgan and um, pretty much stopped it by committing to buy a bunch of stuff. It bounced halfway back up. And they stopped the crash, to I mean, from totally just kind of bottoming. But they couldn't stop the depression. You know? And so. You know, you kind of see that, you know, coming in here. I mean, the bottom was below 50. So, you know, com hey, common story here, right? Wiped out about a, a decade's worth of growth if we look at, like, 2008, 2009. However, if you invest it all, you know, say you're doing, like, you know, how we manage our clients' money to where you're taking money off the table and locking it in, buy low, maybe rebalance, take some money off the table, buy low, buy low. It's not as bad as it looks that if you just bought in at 380 and went all the way down past 50. So, again, you got to be careful. Here's greed, here's fear. And this is bad fear. I mean, really, if you just said, man, I missed out on all of this, I'm just going to get in here, I mean, you've lost 90%. You know, 90%. I mean, that is pretty unprecedented and not seen since. I mean, some, um, somebody bought into the Dow here. At 380, right? Yeah. That greatest pool, as you were talking about. Somebody yeah. bought it that day, and then hopefully they held on to it because it would probably be worth something. Yeah, it probably took to the after the war, but it would have eventually come back. I, I, the more people we have, when, when we go back, just let me make one comment: is um, people don't necessarily understand the value of whatever the underlying asset is, and if you don't understand the underlying value of the asset there's a better chance you're going to be making a mistake. And the more and more financial instruments we have, um, the more likely that is. I always think of Bitcoin if that's going up. You know, who can pinpoint the value of, of Bitcoin to me? And yet it's gone, you know, it's done this, this huge slope up and down over the last couple of years. So um, try to get a feel of what the value is for something you're paying. And then ask yourself, has it really doubled in a year? You know, or has it really gone up by that much of a percent? Um, in most cases, it hasn't. You know, and so you're buying something way overvalued. So our next example, we're going to move on to the savings and loan crisis. Again, I think a lot of people have heard of it. Um, if um, if you are a baby boomer, you live through it. Um, and so if you're, you're watching this and you are younger, then you don't probably know anything about it. Um, but another important, important example of, of things, because... You know, after what Tony and I just talked about from the crash of 29 and the Depression, there was a lot of, of regulation. The, 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 the government said, all right, enough is enough. 
You know, we don't need as much of this boom and bust and um, manipulation. Sometimes Obviously. market manipulation, um, fraud. There needs to be some rules, right? Um, and so they put a lot of regulations to to stop people from speculating as much. Especially, there are a lot of people that have. Um, it's kind of a complicated term, but asymmetry of information. So somebody knows more than somebody else, basically. And then they use that knowledge uh, to victimize them. So I think when you look at the markets like that, one of the nice things about our modern markets and how we've developed them, even though it goes kind of up and down in terms of how good this is, is that it's supposed to be fair. It is illegal to trade off the insider information. It is illegal to manipulate the markets. You can still lose money, absolutely. You know, somebody can be a better investor than you, but it's a pretty fair playing field if you do your due diligence or hire somebody that knows what they're doing, okay? And so it didn't used to be like that. And a lot of these rules got put into place um, after 1929 and the, and the Depression. Um, and the savings and loan crisis is an example of where the government started to, to deregulate, thinking that they could solve a problem. Okay, you want to explain a little bit about what the problem? Yeah, and was. so, and, and but going back to that, this is you know, it's, we we remember the bad times. We live in the bad times, and then we come up with a fix. And sometimes, sometimes the fix is overkill, but oftentimes the fix is useful. And then we ended up pulling it back when things when we have forgotten things, you know, and such. So. So anyway, think of your savings and loans for those of you who don't know. And um, as, as they say in here, the, the Bailey Bill of Savings and Loans from um, um, It's a Wonderful Life. It was meant to be, you know, the banks had consolidated a lot. And so they weren't really focusing on home lending and individual small loans and things like that. And so that is where... Uh, the rise of savings and loans came came about so that they could help you know the average folks. Um, but this was a time, if you remember, if you don't know, the early '80s, where you know interest rates had really inflation was really high in the '70s, and so a way to beat the interest rates or, or you know the inflation was to increase um, interest rates, and they went sky high at that point, and that put pressure on the savings and loans. Because you know they had, um, they were lending out money at a low rate, and it's locked in for a long time, maybe like thirty years, right? Yeah, something. <clears throat> so, and then try, and now having to, um, you know, give out, um, they had to borrow themselves at a really high rate. So that's how banks work. They take in deposits and they pay people interest, and that's why they give them their money, and then they lend it out to someone else, and charge more interest than what they pay the people that have on deposit, and that's how they make money, and so. Um, they did great in kind of a stable, not too much of a changing interest rate environment uh, because that worked great. Uh, but you get into like what Tony was talking about the 70s when the, the interest rates really started pushing up too fast. Um, and then they had locked in these low interest rates of what they were earning. And actually at first, and this is kind of what started the problem, legislatively they weren't allowed to raise their rates enough and so they lost depositors. And so then the government said, all right, you can credit higher interest rates. And it took almost a couple of years, and so they really lost a good amount of money or you know deposits in there to where it was harder for them. So then they really raised rates. Now they're paying too high versus what they're drawing in, started losing money, and it was going to come to the point to where a lot of them were going to be insolvent. Uh, insolvent, you know, meaning that bankrupt, you know, they don't have the funds to continue operations. Yeah, and so the, the cynicism in me says, okay, well, some of these were owned by people who had a good amount of money, or they were actually politicians, in some cases, wealthy families. So they were able to get um, some more lax rules, which is kind of going against what the savings and loans was for. Some of it was probably useful, some of it is not. And so th they were able to take that money and put it into more speculative Investments. Yeah. So they, they change it to say, all right, you can make adjustable rate loans. All right, you can pay more on this. You can in, you can make loans to more speculative real estate investments and energy investments and what so. And unfortunately, it was kind of a gamble, and a lot of that stuff went bad um, in the '80s. And when it did, it just it just exasperated the problem. Now there were some good savings and loans, and there were some bad ones. And so then the government. Try to create these incentives to get the good ones to take in the bad ones, 
but all that did is just basically make the good ones bad too. Yeah. And so it just turned into this whole crisis where they ended up having to bail out um, a lot and then eventually over the next decade or so wind them down. Um, so again, it was a crisis that ended up costing you know the government you know what I think it was some, somewhere it's three or four hundred billion dollars, which was a lot back then. It was huge uh, to, to just fix that problem. Um, yeah, that was really probably end. bigger mm-hmm. than so far we've had in the coronavirus. I mean, that's that's a big number mm-hmm. you know, back then. So. so moving on to long-term capital, this is one of Tony's favorites. So it is. It, this is a. a why I like this story so much is because oftentimes folks want to see what they can do in the markets, try to beat the markets. But it was this collection, this hedge fund of folks that were really well educated, smart people with a lot of hubris. Um, and so they came together, and this was um, so this was what the late '90s, well, I mean, maybe middle '90s, when the markets were just starting to take off. And, and what they were doing was just making, with new instruments out there, they were making these really small, you know, looking for real small gains in places, but with a lot of margin. And so they would really get a lot of leverage so that they could really multiply the gains on the small level. Um, and they did it in a way that really, um, you know, that they, they really protected themselves from most things. But you're always going to have what we would call a black swan event or the long tail event. Um, and if you're not careful, if you're not prepared, that's what can bring you down. You know, ultimately, that is what happened with this group of people. Uh, but really, what's interesting to me is just the hubris. I mean, they were using all these big uh, brokerage companies on Wall Street to, to get their money to borrow, to borrow money. And, and they were... Uh, they were you know, rude to people and stuff. I mean, so it was really interesting. Well, they're the smartest guys in the room, right? You know, and so um, it was uh, John Merriweather, uh, was it Morgan Scholes, um, multiple people that were just like giants in the game. And so, you know, they were doing something that was legitimate, but you could see that this kind of is kind of like what we were talking about when you were talking about Charles Ponzi, like charismatic people that are doing something that you know, is legit, and then they promised too much to too many people, and then they had to live up to those expectations. And so, like Tony said, they they super leveraged the money to take something that was a legitimate strategy and ratchet it up to something that gave kind of absurd returns. I mean, I think that they were making something like 25 to 50 some percent on something that's supposed to be a conservative arbitrage. Arbitrage means taking two sides of a bet where that most of the time, if you're right, you kind of make money from both sides converging in. Well, in their case, they were doing a convergence arbitrage that are converging in. And if you're not right, then, and things diverge, hopefully one side of the bet offsets the other. So worst kind of scenario, you don't make anything. But there are, like Tony said, black swan type events that should be very low probability um, that could blow you up if they happened. Um, and a lot of times, these super smart guys, and they hired quants. It was kind of one of the first time where they hired people with high math degrees and uh, physics degrees and what so to like make algorithms to like take this financial theory, you know, to a new level. And again, they were the smartest guys in the room, and nothing could go wrong. They were the financial dream team. And and I think Tony made a great comment to me the other day because we we weren't going to do this one. He's like, I think we should do this one because every once in a while I get somebody to say. You know, somebody's doing something really interesting with their 401k or, you know, with this investment. It seems really smart. You know, this is a terrific example of some of the smartest people in finance doing something they can't lose, and they blew it up. And so what ended up happening is they did so well and took in so much money that what they were doing, there was not even enough trades for them to do it. So they had to give back some of the money. They went on to, you know, kind of get into options and and what so, in emerging economies and what so, and they just had to bet so much. And again, leveraging that when the bets didn't go their way, even though in normal times they should have kind of canceled out or been low, they really got in serious trouble. And there were so many banks and financial institutions that had lended to them that they actually had to get the government to step in and coordinate the banks to rescue them. And as soon as the asset prices calmed down, they're like, Oof, we almost got thrashed by this one little, I guess they weren't. 
little in terms of assets, but this one little company was just sell everything off and like shut this down. Right. That, and say, how, that's yeah. how big it can get. Yeah. You know, to have such an effect on the whole economy and the whole financial stability of our markets and such. So, um, and it turned out it was the Russian currency that they were betting that on was, because it had gone down, gone down, gone down. But um, Russia was uh, finally stopped supporting the currency, and it really. Well, they were hoping that they were going to get a monetary loan, and when they said they weren't going to, I think that kind of crushed it. Right. Yeah. And they just they kept doubling down to try to fix their mistakes, you know. So again, something seems too good to be true. It seems risk free, you know. Sometimes, even if you're the smartest person, it's hard to figure out in the end what's going to go wrong. But again, human decisions came into play there. The hubris of thinking that you can't lose. Secondly, everybody trying to jump on board, and maybe that strategy would have worked with a limited amount of money for a long time. But as soon as everybody saw that it was great. They wanted to jump on board the wagon, right. and there wasn't enough seats before that wagon fell apart. And they, they, they all walked into that pot of gold, yeah. you know, what everybody's doing. So, so the last one we're going to do here is the subprime crisis, uh, one thing that pretty much all of us have lived through. Um, and so when we think about this, this was you know kind of our worst downturn um, of people that are still alive. Mm -hmm. And so you know what caused this? Again, Another asset bubble, right? Um, and it, it's, I mean, this is not an easy thing to just say one thing did this, yeah. you know? So I think we talk about the subprime crisis. It's kind of part of the definition is, you know, lending on the homes, how well people have done throughout history on real estate, you know, since World War II, um, and our ability through programs like savings and loan, and then later on, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And then, of course, them kind of being privatized and really ramping that up so everybody can own homes. And it got to the point to where banks were originating things to make fees, but not to hold the loans on their own books. And so they weren't even really checking to see how these people were going to pay these things back. So subprime, you know, generally means is, is, is we're, we're not in the prime, you know, best. We're coming down shelf to say, all right, let's try to get loans for people that are iffy, that they'll be able to pay it back. Right. right? And, and it wasn't. It wasn't that. That's the nice way to say it, right? Because there was the other the end of it, the other end of this, where people were making money. So the money people were trying to find creative ways to be able to to finance this and to package the financing in sophisticated ways, where everybody seemed to be making a lot of money. So everybody seemed to be doing well. Um, the, the financial statements of um, Wall Street companies were really doing, you know, as well. And it was like, okay, you got to give me more. We got to keep these numbers up. How are you going to do more? So then we would package and make worse and worse loans, but yet still keep, you know, we rely for those things on rating agencies like Standard & Poor's, um, to, to name one, and um, they were doing a poor job of rating them. And so all the it just kept all of them. I don't mean to just pick on one. They were all bad. And so it just kept, <laughs> it, it just kept on, I'm, I'm forgetting off the top of my, my head the other name. So, um, Finch and Moody's. Finch and Moody's. And, um, but, that, so it was just everybody was had, kind of had a hand in this, saying, you know, just keep the keep everybody keep was making rolling. money, you know. And again, this is one that it got out of hand, and everybody was winning, and there were tons of culprits, and everybody just wanted to make money and benefit from this. So you know, from the bottom person saying, "You mean I can just tell you I make this much, and you give me a loan, I can buy a house, and then I can sell it next year and make fifty thousand dollars? I make one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Right. All right, you got a loan, sir." Right. Yeah, so like from the bottom of the ladder to that middle man that's saying, well, I don't know that I totally believe this guy. I don't have to do a check in income verification. I get this through. I get paid 5%, you know, on the origination of this loan or, well, the, the bank does, and I get a 1% bonus or something on it. Um, like everybody's making money. Then these loans, you yeah. say, well, who's buying these loans? Well, you know, it's just, there's not enough capacity just for the government organizations you know, to buy them. So then the financial companies are like, holy crap, we can make a ton of money if we just, you know, maybe maybe one loan is risky and nobody wants to hold it for 30 years, but we could package a bunch of them together and make these things called CDOs, you know, collateralized debt obligations or mortgage debt obligations. We'll get the rating agencies to say that their triple A debt, like as good as high quality debt from the government and what so, and we'll sell them to investors. And they can make 
five percent per year off of collecting these mortgage payments instead of getting a government bond for two percent per year um and it's the same rating it's the same risk right no it wasn't right um you had the middleman really with the big financial companies saying we need more we need more and then other people at this end wanting more and it was just everybody involved this goes back i remember friends who were buying houses and it was like this is as close as we as people get to really understanding the value of something and to show still how difficult it is that when you're looking at a home you can see all these different prices and things like that area and you could have a pretty good idea of what that home should cost but even at this point when people really had a better idea of the asset um, they were still convincing themselves that it was a you know greater up fool. and up and up and up uh, for no good reason I mean, it went, we don't want to dig into this. This is huge. There's so much you could say into this, you know. Um, um, there are great books, you know, written about it as well, too. So if you want to get all the, the information. Uh, but there were even more complicated things, derivatives and insurance contracts on the derivatives. That's what pulled down a lot of the financial system uh, when this thing kind of busted that really became the crisis. And then, of course, once everybody wanted out and they didn't know what was good and what was bad, all of the debt obligations and mortgage obligations became became suspect, right? So it's like, right. well, let's just assume that they're worth zero, which is totally ridiculous. Did you default on your house? Probably not, right. you know? So most of us kept paying our mortgages on stuff, and so most of those were good. So again, you're going to have these boom and busts as long as we keep our heads uh during these things, don't get caught up in the greed, don't get caught up in the fear. A lot of these boom and busts become opportunities. However, you know, one of the things, you know, our country's kind of success has been built on the middle class. Uh, unfortunately, most of the middle class and, and the mass amount of Americans do worse during bigger boom and busts. And regulation tends to serve to smooth that out more. And when we deregulate, are there more opportunities for ultra wealthy people to, um, to benefit pretty much from the misfortune of others, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so I think we shouldn't be too quick, even if you are a person that likes smaller government or is more conservative, to say let's deregulate because um, it, it may not be good for you, it may not be good for your kids, it may not be good for your extended family. Um, but the aggregate financial prosperity over forty or fifty years uh, can be better. Um, and then beyond that, kind of the other point that we're just trying to make about going over this um, during the middle of this pandemic and what will probably be a pretty decent recession. Uh, some people are saying that it could be a depression, but I very seriously doubt it. Um, is that things happen. Things have always happened. Things are going to happen again in the future. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't invest. It doesn't mean we should throw in the towel on things or that we're wrong. Is it, are people going to get everything right? No way. We're people. <laughs> right? No, you know? No. Uh, but yeah, we do totally recommend, uh, you know, improving yourself, you know, check out these great courses. Um, if you do want to read something like this, um, you know, it's a really great read. It's not as boring as the tagline subject would, uh, would maybe uh, indicate, um, and you'll be better off for it. Um, just, you know, just kind of knowing what we went through and what other people went through. Um, history is important, even though I don't think it gets much props uh, these days in the educational field because what are you going to do with it as a career? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, I tell you, from a book read, it is great, right? There's 24 different lessons. And you know what? We've come back from each and every one of them, mm -hmm. right? There's been some pain along the way, but each and every one of them we've come back from. We will come back from this one, and, and you know, the, we'll only be have a stronger market and hopefully a better economy, certainly than right now. Um, going forward, hopefully learn a lesson or two. Although that is probably the least likely uh, of what I just said. So, so this was a huge one because it was a huge book. <laughs> but uh, you know, engage us, start the conversation. Let us know what books you'd like to hear about in the future. We appreciate you joining us for another Friday. Hope you are staying healthy and safe and enjoying spring um, and staying six feet away, but still, hopefully keeping up your social contact in other ways, uh, since we are social creatures, and as we mentioned, not computers or robots. We need to do a better job with the six feet, right? But, we're, but we uh, we took the precautions, got a big plan in front of us. So. Sucks up BOCs and maybe coronaviruses. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, have a great weekend, and uh, 